online at 560theanswer.com on the AM560 mobile app, on your Alexa-powered smart speaker, and on TuneIn, iHeart, and on Odyssey. This is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy, independent journalist Matt Taibbi, a man generally of the left. Remember, he wrote a book about Trump being a clown. But he's been one of the uh, chief conduits for making Twitter documents public. Elon Musk's Twitter files that he is running through uh, people like Taibbi and Barry Weiss and Michael Schellenberger to get out into the public domain this public-private censorship combine that exists between big government and big tech. Tybee was on with uh, Maria Bartiroma yesterday, summarizing uh, his perspective on all of the Twitter documents that have been released to date. I think the major revelation of the Twitter file so far is that we've discovered an elaborate uh, bureaucracy of what you might call public-private censorship. Uh, Basically, companies like Twitter had a system by which they received tens of thousands of requests for action on various accounts, typically through the DHS and the FBI, but these requests were coming from basically every agency in the government. We've seen them from the HHS, uh, from the uh, from the Treasury, from the DOD, uh, even from the CIA, and they will send basically launch and on those accounts. And in many cases, uh, Twitter is complying. Yeah, it's funny as as I was reading these tens of thousands of emails, we would put them into different buckets. So this might be a First Amendment particular uh, issue over here. Uh, This might be a revolving door question over here. But then over here, we had a bucket called improper asks. And there you might see something like the FBI asking for user identification or IP addresses or handles. And in some cases, even things like geolocation of individual accounts. Now, the problem is we don't see always see the other side Uh, of these transactions, but we can definitely see the government asking for these things. Uh, So these are things that are, they're not entitled to, uh, usually without a subpoena or without a warrant, but they're asking for them anyway, because they have a very close relationship with these companies. Uh, And in some cases, we're not talking about a few accounts, we're talking about thousands of accounts where they're asking for handles or IP addresses or other information. And that I think is very dangerous. For more on this, please be joined by Lieutenant Colonel Jim Carafano, VP of the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Institute for International Studies at the Heritage Foundation, author of Brutal War, Jungle Fighting in Papua New Guinea, 1942. Jim, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Yeah, you know, in principle, there's nothing wrong with public private sector cooperation. If you go back to World War II, for example, there were, there were many instances where universities, and industry uh, had all kinds of conversations in cooperation with the U.S. government in, in pursuit of winning World War II. But we saw in the 1960s, for example, during the height of the anti-war and civil rights movement, that there were many times where government either actually crossed a line or did activities similar to this, which were conducting all kinds of queries on public safety or public interest, and there were no guardrails, there was no ruling, and there was no oversight. And this resulted in something called the Church Committee, yeah. uh, which have revealed all kinds of, in some cases, crimes, but in a lot of cases, the abuses of government should not be doing these things. Well, there, there's yeah, something... What we see here is, 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 is actually far greater than anything we saw in the 1970s. So public-private cooperation is fine, as long as there are guard rules, and oversight, and protection of, of civil liberties and constitutional rights. And in this case, not only does it seem that those were not put in place, but they were actually disguised and ignored so people wouldn't know that these activities existed, so people couldn't have a debate about what kind of activities to put in place. So this is, to me, one of the most egregious abuses of civil liberties we have seen really since 
since World War One. Uh, I agree with that, and in in the the difference uh, between this big tech, big government combine, and you know, say the J. Edgar Hoover era at the FBI. Oh, by the way, it's Martin Luther King Day, so all on on the left who are are you know unquestioningly uh, proponents of the FBI. I mean, maybe you want to remember the performance during the Civil Rights era, but uh, okay. I, but I digress. The difference here is. The government using private companies to do things that they can't do, and that's also a constitutional violation. You're not allowed to uh, you know, w uh, do an end run around the First Amendment by listing private parties to pr put restraints on that you couldn't legitimately put on yourself. Right. If you ask somebody else to rob a bank, you're a bank robber, and the, and the federal government doesn't have the authority to ask somebody to commit a crime. I mean, there are some instances where they can do some forgive crimes and things like that, but the federal government doesn't actually have authority to commit crimes. Therefore, asking other people to commit crimes or constitutional violations on your behalf is, is not legitimate. And even if there was some kind of fine legal line, clearly this is not how people intended or want their government to operate, which is to just ignore oversight and rules and regulations and privacy and everything else by just getting somebody else to do that for them. So this is, a, this is a really big deal. And what's important about this is it's not a couple of rogue agents. This is a, obviously a national policy on behalf of the Biden administration. And, and when we talk about this, we shouldn't forget it wasn't just limited to federal agencies. It seems like every member of the Democratic leadership uh, in the Congress had equal authority to do this. Right. And you have to remember, this is done where nobody knows this is going on. There is no oversight. There is no disclosure. There is no discussion of this at all. And you can't say, well, it was for national security reasons. Because in many of these things, it's very clear and apparent. There is no national security connection. There is no crime. In many of the cases, these requests are, I don't like what this guy is saying. And they're just declaring something misinformation or a problem or a threat. You know, we, you know, I, when we said this on your show before, and now I think it you know, kind of has to be carved in stone maybe at the Martin Luther King Monument, which is you cannot create government that is people-proof. You know, we can put all kinds of requirements. In, we saw this with FISA. So FISA is, as a matter of fact, we're coming up on a debate on this. FISA is the, uh, basically the federal authority to do a secret wiretap or, or, or a secret warrant, right? Because you don't want for because for national security reasons or public safety or something you don't want to disclose this because it's a problem. So we have a whole special system in place to go to a judge to essentially get a secret warrant. But the whole idea of the system was to, in the process of doing this, still protecting people's constitutional rights and liberties. And we saw all kinds of abuses that occurred under that. And now this is coming up for people who say, "Well, let's, let's not do this anymore." Well, of course you have to do it because you need. You need these authorities because there are legitimate requirements for them. But you also have to have a process in place to protect people's liberties. When you elect people and you put them in government and you allow them to work in federal service forever and they don't believe in these processes and liberties, you're going to get violations like this. We've seen uh, it again and again and again throughout our history. Speaking of national security, oversight and transparency, the uh, Biden Class, the classified documents in Biden's possession, they keep turning up a cookie jar, the cupboard. They're all over the place, apparently, at his home. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it seems to me we're, despite what the, uh, the best efforts of Democrats on the Sunday talk shows, we're at the middle of this story. We're starting in the middle of the story. Right. We don't know why the attorneys did a search for classified documents in the first place. And we don't know uh, how they're inadvertently placed everywhere and by whom. And actually, even before that, we don't know why these documents were selected for removal to Biden's private residence and then to his phony think tank um, or who selected them. We, we don't know any of this. All we have is a few statements from his legal representatives about how uh, they did the right thing and turned documents they discovered over to the National Archives and are cooperating with the Department of Justice. And this is an example of the Biden administration doing the right thing. Yeah, I, I was two problems with, with this story. One is when, this, when these 
um, disclosures actually take place. This is another example of where, including with a whole bunch of people, they pushed off bad news until after the election. Right. Yep. Just like Hunter's laptop, where they actually colluded to deprive the American public of information that, that maybe would be relevant to their choice until after the election. It's a really partisan political <clears throat> act. And if there's a crime involved, you could argue it's, it's obstruction of justice. That's a problem. The second problem is <clears throat> their explanation is a big problem right off the point. As somebody who was in the military for 25 years, had a clearance my entire time, had clearances after that dealt with classified information my whole life, which is why I got out of that business. I didn't want to clear inside it. What I'm going to do with this stuff is, they said, well, this is inadvertent. Well, when you're given the responsibility for the custody of classified documents, it doesn't matter how they get misused. It doesn't matter if you leave them in Starbucks by accident or if you pass them off to a Soviet agent. Inadvertent handling of classified documents is mishandling of classified documents. So what they essentially they've got done is come out and committed. They, they did something that was grievously wrong. They mishandled classified documents. And for the press and everybody just jump off and say, well, it's not like Trump it was inadvertent. Well, first of all, it's wrong. And, and again, exactly like the Hunter Biden story, as you pointed out, we're in the middle of the story. They come out and they declare this guy innocent. And they don't even have all the facts before them. Whereas with Trump, it was he's guilty. And then we'll, we'll go find facts to prove that. So we have, excuse me, we have reached such a level of partisanship in in the reporting and in the act of public act of governance that that this is this is really beyond the pale. Yeah, but I mean, why is it that Biden's personal attorneys who have no security clearance at all they're allowed to search for more documents instead of the FBI? So right there, there's different treatment between Trump and President Biden. Uh, it does seem incredibly inappropriate that you would have somebody without a clearance reviewing documents to see if they're classified or not. And and for lawyers to do that seems, right. again, wildly inappropriate. Now, to ask a government agency, the FBI, or to come in and do that in the presence of the lawyer, with the lawyers, that's perfectly appropriate. <laughs> to basically say, well, we'll look at our stuff and then we'll tell you if we find anything. <laughs> and why, aren't, why isn't like people with a clearance, like the White House counsel or something doing this. I, I don't know. Uh, as you point out, it just raises way more questions than it answers. But don't you think President Obama is involved in this? I mean, he's vice president. He can't declassify anything. Who gave him those documents? Um, again, you, as you pointed out, we're in the middle of a story. So there's so many questions that are unanswered here. But what's very, very clear is, not to sound like a broken record here, but one, information was denied the American public when it was most relevant. Yep. And, and two is, you know, we're not, we don't have a full and clear accountability, and yet we have this mad rush to say nothing to see here, move on. Now, look, I've heard people say that, you know, this is actually a, a Democratic plot to take Biden down. So it is ironic. Not that they're connected, because I don't know if they are. But literally... A week ago, Biden was at the height of his power. I mean, you know, we were all calling him Chauncey Garden and everything else. But then he could turn to his base and say, look, I delivered on every single major legislative promise I promised you. I've done amazing things. I'm going to ban gas stoves. And, you know, we didn't get hammered in the election as badly as people thought. And Biden was so emboldened and so empowered by the feeling of really invincibility that he even had the courage to go to the border, which is something he wouldn't do for two years because he was just afraid to get hammered, but he, but he felt, I can't even go to the border and talk nonsense at the border now. I'm invulnerable. And yet, literally a week after this, his presidency is, is, uh, is, um, is, in, is threatened. So it, it is ironic, but I, I don't know. He is Lieutenant Colonel Jim Carafano, VP of the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Institute for International Studies at the Heritage Foundation. Have some chicken noodle soup, Jim. Oh, uh, yeah, apparently. All right, thanks, buddy. Thanks for <laughs> Thank you. Me. Thank you, and he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. The more you listen, the more you listen, the more you'll know. This is Chicago's Morning Answer. Morning Answer. On AM 560, The Answer. The bigger your 401k, the better your retirement, right? Wrong. 
The fact is, with proposed new taxes, another market crash, inflation, and rising health care costs, you could be forced to downsize your retirement. Discover the secret savvy investors are turning to for retirement security. A new 401k law that unlocks an ingenious retirement protection plan that could protect your savings from inflation and a stock market downturn while boosting your retirement income 